Hey, how you doing? Hey, uh, this is Admin. Just going to do a quick video on uh, Docker, a little bit about Portainer. I think it's something that's not really covered too well in documentation, and sometimes um, it can kind of wrap people's minds when you talk about it. If you're really advanced and you know more than I do, hey, go for it. It's all good. Um, but anyways, can you do me a quick favor? Can you uh, like and uh, subscribe to the video? Uh, basically, this does help build the uh, community. So, um, you know, everything you do does help us. Uh, anyways, uh, so what I want to talk about is the importance of Docker and what it does for you. So the issue that I used to run into before was before I really understood Linux and Linux is still secondary to me, but it's great for servers and, and Plex and everything else that you see here is, is that uh, I would I would always have anxiety about picking remote servers because I always had to get something with Windows. But there was always so many limitations to it. You know, either it wasn't powerful enough or you had to pay a lot of money, a lot of people didn't offer it, or if you try to get a virtual machine with Windows on it, it just outright sucked. And there's firewall rules and issues just on and on and on. So um, in combination with that, in trying to uh, understand Linux because of Plex Drive and other things that are required, uh, you know, the whole Google API ban thing, um, I had to learn Linux, but uh, I found that there was these powerful servers out there that would um, allow you to install um, Linux, but uh, I also discovered you can install ESXi. So being safe, I went ESXi first, and uh, ESXi has a limitation of uh, eight virtual processors. So free limitation of ESXi. What ESXi is, it's a virtual machine Oh, operating system and it allows you to install you know multiple copies of uh, Windows it allows you to um, understand uh, I mean install multiple copies of Linux but the thing is you're only limited to eight core processors so you know Google sometimes useless but here it's actually find something right there so the thing is the limitation is is that you're allowed to use them up to two physical computer uh, CPUs and eight virtualized CPUs. So what this means is that, for example, I have a 20 core uh, server with 40 threads. So if I decide to use ESXi, a limitation that I'll run into is, is poof, I couldn't use everything. I could create multiple virtual machines, but it would be a nightmare to run five flex servers all running off one disk and multiple libraries on and on and on. So um, in discovering Linux and, and, and learning about Docker at the same time, it was really easy for me to grasp because of the use of virtual machines. I did actually have virtual machines on my physical PC. So, for example, like I'd, I'd down, you know, have a second copy of Windows 10 doing something while my main computer wasn't touched. But the problem is you're running a whole other operating system. So what Docker does, it allows you to create, uh, basically it downloads images. Uh, based on images that are created and what it does is it uses very minimal resources and runs a very particular program so for example you can run Plex within a container so if I type docker because I already have it installed on the system if I type docker ps what I can see is, is I can see certain uh, containers that are launched like portainer watchtower traffic so these things these things have their own containers now what's cool about these containers that I didn't really understand at first was is that you can force data to go to certain locations. So, for example, if you had Plex before, you would have to uh, track down where it was installing its stuff at, and it's just always a headache. And you always run into this thing called dependency hell because uh, sometimes, depending on what version of Linux you were on or what you were using, things just wouldn't work because you were missing this, this. You had to install this key. It was just you know that's what made Linux a pain. But with all these containers, uh, who I think very much as a Linux uh, server IO when I first tried to understand this stuff I went to them and I was like oh this is what this is so a majority of our images we actually download from them uh, they do have a great community um, and they do a lot because you obviously can see how many pools they have here so you can see that their community is very big and what I've learned to do is, is we could pull certain images from them and to launch certain programs on your computer. Though so the cool thing about these programs is you can literally just destroy them outright, not lose the data if you saved it externally and just redeploy it again. You don't have to uninstall, you just do it again. So right now, Portainer is at port 9000. So we're gonna go to Portainer. So obviously you can see here at the trash domain that there's port 9000. Um, so let's look at our uh, dashboard here and so right now you can see we have 
six containers running. So you've got Plex, we got uh, Deluge VPN, Watchtower, Traffic, Portainer. So the irony is this, if I delete this, <laughs> this program won't work. I've, I've actually done that before. So you can actually outright remove programs. So if I go to um, FFplex and I type 32400, obviously we, we're going to know to some extent it should load Plex. You see how it works. But if I go here now, and let's say we destroy it, see, we just outright just destroy it. You can stop it if you want, or you can remove it. So I'm just going to outright remove it, right? If I outright remove this program, there's Plex loading, but now if I try again, I should be getting a timing out. You see how it doesn't work anymore? It's because literally I removed the entire program just like that. But the cool thing about these programs, though, is, is that with Plex, Plex Guide, is that we have data saving in certain locations. So CD op data. This will be what you need to know, basically, for any of these programs you're running. So you notice that we isolated all the data to be stored in very specific uh, locations. But even though we destroyed Plex, we kind of didn't. The reason is, is because the data is still there. So if I launch Plex again, like if I say, hey, you know, rebuild it, launch Plex again, guess what's going to pop up? all that data. So sometimes you might destroy a container and you might be pissed off saying, why are my configurations still showing up? It's because you got to remove it from here. But we purposely have it in this location to make it easy for you to find. And it's good for you because if you ever want to back it up, you can back it up and you can restore it and you're good to go. So actually that's how our backup program works. It, it basically looks for a very specific name, zips it up and sends it to your Google Drive. And then when you want to store it, it uh, downloads it and then unzips it and brings it all back in the right location. So um, right now, if I type Docker PS, we'll see Plex missing. And obviously, we saw Plex missing from up there. So how does it basically install? Well, it installs. Uh, Docker basically uses YMLs to install everything. Um, this is a little bit over the top because it, uh, this is Anzabel, which is, uh, helps launch a lot of bash functions. And it also basically has the core information to deploy a container. So that's how these containers are created. You have to write it up. Um, everything does have to be dress right dress. So if I decide to push this publish ports to right here, you think it does nothing. It will throw errors at you and, piss, and, and you'll piss Docker off and it will do nothing for you. So um, these are the ports that I will publish, which is important because if you don't put the ports that are out there, then when you execute the program, it's not gonna know how to reach outside of itself because you can force um, one port internal, like you can say, hey, I want port 32400 to come out of port 6500 on my real machine. Um, so not that you'll do that, but you notice that a lot of these line up because this is the inside container and the outside container. Here you can also dictate permissions. So for Plex Guy, we use you know the general 1000, 1000. Um, if the permissions are not right, um, your Docker container can experience uh, it can experience a lot of problems accessing your files outside, as we had learned when we first built Plex Guy 5, because um, everything was root and we kind of had to kind of secure it a little bit more. Um, this is uh, going to be your money maker right here, the volumes. So you notice here that we're at um, CD op, you know, we're at opt app data Plex. You notice here it says opt app data Plex. Um, and then you see database. So what happens is everything on the right, and this took me a while to grasp, either to the right of that colon, this is this is how your container sees it. So the real data is sitting right here in our machine, but for the container's sake, we're saying at the root of this Docker program, like slash config, here's all your information on, on the real side. So um, because you don't want to go into the Docker container and, and, you know, create all these long, unnecessary paths. It's just like to the point, you know, so... The way we can see this, which I wish I'd have knew at the beginning too, was through Portainer. Portainer is going to be awesome for you. So uh, Portainer is something that I discovered along the way. It's not something that comes standard with Docker. It is free. And you can use this basically to see how your containers see everything. So this is how you can troubleshoot certain issues like permissions and other things. So you see this little icon right there. So right now, let's load up Plex. So we're going to bring up Plex Guide. And if you, some of you already use this, you know how fairly easy it is to do it. So Plex Guide. And then we're going to go to Programs. And we're going to go to Media Servers and Plex. And you see, we make it easy for you. So basically, once we launch that, um, 
it's going basically through these steps right here. See? So what Antebell is like saying, hey, do this, do that, do this. Um, because we did bash everything out at first. Now that was a headache. Um, so right now you see it's pulling the image. It deployed the container with, along with all those rules. And right now it's installing web tools. So if you look at the bottom, this is web tools. So this is not really technically part of Docker doing this. Uh, this is Antebell doing this. But the launching of the container itself right here, right here is um, Docker. So anyways, if I go to Portainer now and I refresh, I should see Plex showing up. No whammy, no whammy, no whammy, stop. There we go, there's Plex right there. See, with all those lovely published ports and, and the type that you have and everything. So anyways, um, let's see how Plex sees everything. So for all purposes, you should always be logging as 1000, 1000 the, for how Plex Guide works. Um, because if you load up a root, you're going to get misleading information on your permission issues. So we noticed that we typed, uh, okay, so for example, we declared that slash config should see all of this. So right now, if I'm in, in, in Portainer, I should see config right at the root. See? Uh, config. See, there it is right there. But if I type cd config, there's the library. Now on the real machine, and this is the aha moment. Okay. <laughs> Can't move too fast through my own program. Okay. So if I type cd op app data plex, which you already app, but just see, uh, there's database transcode. So I'm going to type cd database and there's the library. And the reason that is, it's like that is because if you pay careful attention to it, it's opt app data plex database. So if I type the word cd cat tx, or sorry, touch cat txt, right? We see it here, just like that, right at the root, you know, it's just there. We should be able to see it on the real machine. See, there it is. And that is the power of Docker. So um, the cool thing is you can force all the data within Docker to push into one particular location. So if I'm a bonehead and I decide to remove all of these like volumes, it will still work. The problem is the data stays within the container. And the reason that's bad is because if we decide to go to Plex, let's say destroy this container because we had issues. Well, because you were a little bit of an idiot, the database, right? This config and the tra well, the transcode's not important, but the, the database, well, it disappears because you never pushed it out externally. You never pushed it out. So the database is going to disappear when you destroy the container. So you can, you can actually open up anything you want. So for some reason, if you decide to, there's an important file inside of Plex, you can actually decide to just go ahead and write your own volume rule there. It says, hey, on my computer, I want it under op app data Plex slash important colon, and then it could be called important. And then you can have Plex point to it. Um, so depending on your experience that you, you, you know, this could be a little above you, this might be a little bit under you, but I'm just trying to give you the general idea of how powerful Docker is. So now if I bring up this 32400, it should come right up now. It should. You know how Murphy... Murphy likes to play. See how it comes up? And that's it. So you can literally launch many, many programs. So if we look here, if we look here, we notice that we do not have, uh, let's say, Sonar. Sonar is missing. So if I want to launch Sonar, here's Plex Guide to Rescue, Programs, Managers, and we're going to go to Sonar. And basically, it's going to look up one of those YMLs. See, it's removing the old one just in case it exists. It deploys it. So it's pulling an image down. It's pulling it down. It's adding all the rules to it, you know, the port numbers. And, and, and also, when you launch these containers, be a little patient. So, for example, Omni might take like three minutes to load up. So if your program's not loading up right away, there's a lot of factors. Depending, you know, it could be your CPU power. It could be the program itself booting up. So don't, don't get wrapped around the wheel. Um, because, again, I didn't know that, and I did get wrapped around the wheel. So... You can see here we could type port 8989. So if I type FF Plex, and it might not come up right away. So if I type 8989, if I type that, let's see. You see? Uh, it, nothing came up, but now you saw it come up. And now it's the part that I was talking about earlier. It will drive you back crazy. See? 
So if I go to Portainer, we should reload and we should be able to see. We should be able to see sonar come up. And there you go. That's how easy it is. And out of shits and giggles, we can stop it. So sometimes you may stop a container or you have to restart it just because you're having issues. So if I say stop the container and I do this, see how it just stopped working? And then if you notice here, last thing, is that sonar, when it was created, it launched its data in one particular location. So cd opt app that of slash sonar directory, and poof, there's all the information for sonar. So even if you destroy the container, the, 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 the library and everything else is still here. Um, so again, this is just a little bit of an intro into Docker. Uh, it's not, it wasn't, you know, properly planned. Sometimes just talking off the hip. Um, sometimes it's a little bit better. Um, I'm just trying to give you how I see things. So um, that's why Plex Guide is so powerful because of these Docker containers. So basically most of what you're launching is Docker containers. Uh, almost everything that you're doing. Um, but that is pretty much it. Again, just do me a favor. Just, you know, hit subscribe or like, you know, if you got comments, questions, please post. And then, like I said, you can come visit our community over here. You know, so we, we touch it up and we see new members keep coming all the time, asking questions. Uh, come by, you know, help out, have a chat with us. Uh, again, I appreciate your time. Thanks.